Welcome back to Boiler House Garage. In this video we're going to be doing a basic service and minor inspection on this 2007 Vauxhall Combo. It's a 1.3 litre turbo diesel Fiat multi-jet engine used in many cars. This Vauxhall Opal setup is likely identical to the diesel Corsa of this era too. We'll be changing the air filter under here and remove and clean this airflow sensor as the owner describes it as going into link mode now and again. Being a diesel that hasn't been serviced in a long time, I'm going to change the fuel filter which is inside this housing. The oil filter housing is very conveniently located near the oil filler cap, which we can remove now as a reminder to refill before starting it up. Because the filter is changed at the top of the engine, you can suck out the old oil from the dipstick tube using a vacuum pump, but we'll be draining it from underneath as I'm also going to be having a poke around and give it a cursory inspection. If you work or are looking to work on all makes and models of cars, then you should look to get a set of various oil drain plug adapters, as many Italian and French engines, remembering this is a Fiat engine, have ones with a recessed hex head, square head, allen key or even a Torx. You'll find when you start to do gearbox and differential fluid changes that um, they use this style on most cars old and new. The sump plug on this engine uses a smaller than you'd expect T45 torque socket, so handily I can fit this straight into a quarter inch ratchet. Let's scoot underneath to get to the sump here. This engine is hot and yes I do have an axle stand under the sill. Here's the sump plug with its diddly little socket. You'd have thought it wouldn't be overly tight using uh, one so small, but it still needed a bit of force due to the lack of leverage from the small ratchet. Made a bit of a mess but luckily I put a sheet down. Once it's all drained out put the plug back in, it has a fixed rubber seal rather than a crush washer. I wonder how many miles and hot and cold cycles this oil has seen. According to the service book it hasn't been serv serviced for around 75,000 miles and although the oil is evidently very old and tar like sticking to the bottom of the oil drain tub and even the funnel I'd like to think it has been done more recently with that just without record. Look at this exhaust. It looks like the centre bracket has snapped off where it pushes into a rubber hanger which has uh, disappeared with it. It must be making some serious scrapes against speed ramps. I think overall the underside condition isn't bad and it's more of a case of neglect and being passed to uh, one person to the next in its recent years. Let's have a look at the drive shafts and specifically the CV boots. This side seems good, the brake disc is in good order too, but I'll check the pads with the wheels off a bit later. Ah, so the near side CV boot has lost its clamp and subsequently all its grease, so that'll be something that needs seeing to promptly. Without a boot kit clamp pliers end time, I'll have to limit this just to a temporary fix in a sec. It looks to be more of a lip on this brake disc, but it's not and still has lots of miles left in it. The anti-roll bar drop links look okay, the rubber looks worn uh, but not dry and split. The shocks on the other hand aren't looking too well. This has clearly been leaking for quite some time, I thought perhaps this could have been from the CV grease being flung out but it's too high up. Let's check out the other side as they have to be swapped as a pair anyway. Yeah, it's not leaked uh, quite so bad, but it's, the obvious leak is obvious. So, with the steel wheel off, which makes it hard to inspect pad wear, we can see there's a fair bit of life left in the pads. The rear one, or inner one, is that uh, darker or thinner strip towards the left. The lighter brown strip to the left is the disc, and that the pad material makes direct contact with. I think you'd call that sort of 20 to 25% remaining, and the outer pad has just got a little more material on it. This is just to try and keep the CV joint in some bearing grease until it can be repacked and a new boot and clamp can be fitted. 
There's a cable tie on the narrower end, but these should really be secured with those single-use metal bands. Now back to the service. To remove the oil filter housing, take a 27mm socket and undo it. In case of spillage, I've stuffed a small bit of blue roll in here to catch any mess, but there shouldn't be much in here as it's all drained and faces upwards. The motor factor's sent me two oil filters, so there's likely two different housings on these engines. We have Comline part number EOF174 and EOF192. With the oil filter cartridge removed, we can make a comparison between it and the two potential replacements, seeing it's a basic cylinder with just a few locating tabs around the bottom. They're easily identifiable, and it's the right one. No, it isn't. It's the one without the turret on it. Before we fit it, we just need to swap the supplied seal over on the filter housing, ideally using a pick, but a small flathead screwdriver would work, and I've even uh, used a skinny Allen key before. The new seal shouldn't be tightened up dry, so I'm just dabbing a smear of clean engine oil uh, before sliding it over. The new cartridge just pops in and clips with those uh, small tabs that we saw a moment ago. When you refit the filter like this, tighten it by hand and then when it's seated as far down as possible by hand, you can just nip it up with an eighth of a turn with a ratchet. It's supposed to be about 25 newton meters, but my torque wrench can't be set that low. The same eighth turn to tighten applies to the sump plug on this. I usually do a quarter turn on the more common crush washer types. As I've done it on this already, I'm refilling the oil with the recommended 5W30. I think this has a so-called service fill of 3.2 to 3.9 litres, which is very helpful. So I'm basically just going to get it close to 4 litres, as the oil filter is empty, and check it against the dipstick once it's been started for a few moments and then settled again. Now let's move to doing the air filter and removing the math sensor for cleaning. By the look of it, one of the four airbox lid screws is under the sensor housing, so I'll pull that out first. There's a neat little slide clip which secures it, although I'm having a bit of a job wiggling the thing out. Whatever you do, don't pull on the wiring and hold on to the main plastic body instead. I think it's just because I'm trying to left a hand it. I could really do with a better camera equipment, so perhaps at 2000 subs I'll buy a proper camera and stand instead of using my 5 year old phone. The connectors look good, no corrosion. These two Jubilee clips need undoing as there's four screws located as so. The part of the airbox that's tucked under the wing rail will have locator tabs so it lifts away once the other side is loose. The Jubilee clips are 7mm, so we'll get these undone. If you have an automatic watch, this is a good opportunity to wind it up using this technique here. We're full of useful tips on this channel, you know. It's worth getting these Jubilee clips very loose as there's no point struggling trying to refit the plastic to rubber when we reassemble. Now the math housing should just pull out the airbox lid. Let's see if I can left hand it this time. We'll take a closer look at this in a sec. Let's just check out the state of this air filter first. Oh, what a mess. Although it's a shame when vehicle servicing is neglected like this, there's a positive as the car or van in this case will drive much better once it's done and then it looks good on me. The filter has done its job and kept this lot out of the air intake, so I'll get a vacuum in here before the new filter element goes in. You should really use isopropyl alcohol spray, but since I don't have any, I'll use a carb cleaner on this math as it's not quite the right stuff. I'll be spraying it into the outer part so it's not directly hitting the fragile math sensor. First in the direction of the airflow.
Then, if it has dislodged anything, a spray in the opposite direction might help too. I wouldn't recommend directly cleaning the sensor with a cotton bud or anything. I'm not even sure this is causing the occasional limp mode or loss of power as the owner described, so I certainly don't want to make anything worse. I'll let this dry completely before refitting. Now it's time to fit the air filter element into this GIST vacuumed air box. This is a Comline part number EAF038. Although I mentioned it, but I forgot to show you earlier, these are the locating tabs that seat to one side of the airbox lid. Those two lugs fit into these recesses, so you'll have to tuck this side in first before pressing the whole lid down and re-screwing it. I've put a small washer in this corner screw as the plastic has gone a bit brittle, but that's all four nails secured and we'll come back to this later to refit the mat as it's still drying. Meanwhile, let's attempt the fuel filter. The Comline part number for this is EFF201. Let's have a quick look at it to see what we're dealing with. Okay, so like the oil filter housing, the fuel filter housing is a replacement seal, but other than that it's just a simple cartridge. Since I have this can of car cleaner out, I'm going to use it to help clean up this housing as I don't want any of the crud on the outside contaminating the diesel, which would defeat the object of it being filtered. I will have to stress here that I'm doing this the quick and messy way. I think you're supposed to remove this entire assembly from the engine bay and drain the diesel from a tapple valve at the bottom. But I'm going to do this in situ and suck about half the diesel out using my extractor. This collar may have a special removal tool or perhaps the big pliers type of oil filter wrench would work but I'm going to lightly tap a flathead screwdriver into these tabs and then do it anti-clockwise but first we'll have to remove this wiring connector. No idea what it's for but we'll put that aside. So I've lightly tapped this collar with a hammer about half of a turn if that and now it's loose. Remember this housing will be full of diesel so expect a little spillage. Like I say, this is the messy method, and once I've got access to the inside of it, I'm going to get my fluid extractor set up and suck about half of the volume of diesel. I'll aim to get the pipe as far down as possible as these canisters are designed to separate any water that might have contaminated the fuel, uh, and the water will of course settle at the bottom. This is a cool little thing. It was a gift, but I think it was from the middle at Lidl. You just hook it up to your battery uh, clip on the exit pipe or tube onto a container, the oil drain in this case, and then switch it on and vacuum any fluids out of reservoirs or even the oil by going down the dipstick tube. I couldn't film it as needed free hands to remove the high pressure connector on the fuel line, but managed to unclip it with a screwdriver and a trim tool. Again, this is probably something where a specific tool is required, but we can of course improvise. With the lid now loose, we can carefully lift it out along with the old filter. It's a nice easy push fit into the new filter element. 
However, I'm going to omit the new seal as I haven't removed the whole assembly and you might be able to see that there's an outer lip in the way of being able to uh, seat it incorrectly. With the new filter and lid back on, the collar can be refitted. Remember to tap it all the way back on with a hammer and screwdriver just to tighten it a quarter turn or so. The fuel line will be a bit hard to push fit back in, so I'll need both hands for that too. The wiring can be plugged back in, and after a quick wipe down, the filter is done. Before I crank the engine, I'll put the ignition on a couple of times to prime the fuel pump, which should refill the rest of the space in here, as you don't want to have air locks in the fuel lines of a diesel. The MAF sensor should have dried by now, so we can look to get that back in place. It'll probably only fit one way anyway, but it's still worth checking the direction of the airflow. So that's the two Jubilees refastened, and the airbox has popped out of this bracket behind it, making it wobble. It's pushed back into a rubber bush and is uh, secure now. No doubt this wiring block will be easier to refit than it was to remove. As it's now been serviced, time to get rid of the INSP that flashes up on the dash before starting. Most voxels of this era, it's a case of pressing and holding the trip reset button, then turning the ignition on as it's being held. After a few moments, the INSP should disappear, or if it doesn't in this case, try the same procedure again, only with your foot on the brake pedal for the whole time too. Blimey, what a racket. I'm not keen on diesels, although in commercial vehicles they're perfectly suited. Since the early 2000s they've been fitted to ordinary cars and even converted to sports cars, which I've always been critical of. Shall we take it for a quick spin? I drove it earlier to not only warm up the old oil, but to see if I could get it to repeat what the owner was experiencing, but it didn't. You know, I've been wanting to get a small van for a while so I can keep most of my tools in it, rather than have to find out what I need for each particular job I'm doing, then have to find out where the specific tools are as they're spread out between my parents' garage, my nan's garage, and whatever dump I happen to be renting at the time. I did used to run a 1988 Bedford Astra, which was effectively a Mark II Astra estate made into a van. And like the car, it was a single point injection instead of carb, uh, 1.6 petrol, and I think the gearbox was different with ratios to handle weight. When my Mark II Astra GTE gave up the ghost, I swapped over the body kit, seats and wheels to it, so it's quite a funky van. Today, I'd prefer to have something even older than that, but old vans are quite a rarity as well as an oddity. As they were used for commercial purposes, you'll be hard pressed to find something that hasn't done massive mileage and that's not covered in dents and damage from its day-to-day -day activities. Weirdly, I quite like the idea of an early 80s Morris Itel 440, as if it hadn't rotted to death by now, then it's one of the lucky ones. Plus it would be tax and MOT exempt, and the 1275 A-Series engine is uh, such a simple thing to maintain, rebuild or perhaps swap out. They seem to have disappeared off the face of the earth, despite there being so many used by the Royal Mail and the bright yellow BT ones that were everywhere at one point. 
The Marina vans are available, but uh, as they have more of a classic appeal, they command a lot more money. Of course, not having room for tools means not having room for a lot of vehicles either. And while I'm struggling to find a new premises to rent, it looks like I'm sticking to working out the Fiesta's boot for the foreseeable future. Anyway, if this video was helpful to you, please give it a like, and if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to see more servicing and repair videos. I've also got a 1979 Opal Manta project series that I'm slowly adding to, and also do some other stuff like testing petrol for ethanol and octane, and more recently some mileage testing. Any jobs I do on the Fiesta ST I try to record as well, and now and again I'll do a product review of something I'm using, uh, just to test the water really, as to see what videos tend to be the most popular, so I'm still a long way off the 1000 subscriber mark. Uh, but nevertheless, I appreciate anyone who has done already. Thank you to anyone watching. See you in the next one.